Hello YouTube, this is Morgan Airspeed Prime here with my next Shadow of Kyoshi chapter analysis video. This one's going to be for chapter 20 which is called Shape, uh, Shapes of Life and Death. So this is a very interesting chapter because like I sort of set up at the end of the last um, chapter analysis video, Zoryu hasn't made a move so far in the entire book and as much as you feel some sympathy towards him for the situation he's in he also hasn't done anything to really maybe warrant like having a ton of faith in him so Kyoshi's tried and done a lot but here she has sort of failed here and seemingly she's going to bring the whole thing down this is going to make everything worse the war is inevitable as soon as Chaijin and Huazo come back the war has begun and there's no coming back from this so uh, Jinpa and Kyoshi arrive back at the palace and Kyoshi is just a wreck when she comes back. She knows the the significance behind what she's just done and that she is about to bring war to the Fire Nation. She's made it worse by participating. And so she, like Jinpa, just has to bring her up to bed. She has to get some rest here. She is just exhausted from the strain, everything that she's been doing up to now. And... um. She just says the avatar had blacked out from strain and exhaustion. In truth, it was the kind of sleep where she was afraid of tomorrow and what the morning would bring. Tears squeezed out of her shut eyes as she fell into the slumber of weakness. She couldn't simply handle being awake anymore. So, just for like, and you you have to remember, like this is a super inexperienced Kiyoshi. She this is one of her first major involvements in things, and it's gone this badly. So she wakes up. Jimpo wakes her up and is like, "Okay, the the, the fire lord is calling for an assembly." I can't go, but you have to go. So what is going on here? So this is where she thinks, okay, this is this is Zoryu. The only thing he can do here is basically sort of try to end things as peacefully as possible. He's going to just have to like just admit sort of defeat here in some way. So when she gets there, Zoryu gives a speech. And, you know, he goes through the whole thing. You know, he, he talks about the attacks that... Um, this year's festival of Zeto hasn't gone so well that it seems like the spirits are against me. I've, I've faced all of these challenges as the Fire Lord that um, he has to avenge this light upon our honor. This is something he has to do as the Fire Lord. So everyone is kind of like, oh, what's he building up towards here? And he says, let it be known that the spirits of the islands have been watching my reign since its inception, judging my fitness to be Fire Lord. With the attack upon the palace, they put me to the final test, and I have passed it. I have found the perpetrator. Bring him out, please. And so Kyoshi's like, wait, 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 what? Zoryu has somehow managed to find and capture Yun? That's the only explanation for this. And this was the other solution to this, which seemed sort of impossible the way things were going, was that Zoryu can win either by proving the Selwan clan out to be traitors, or... If he was the one, the people behind him were the ones to capture Yoon and bring this honor on the Fire Nation to an end. So it seems like Zoryu has managed to do that um, himself. So she's just shocked by this as um, this man is brought out, there's like a hood on his head, um, he's confessed to the crimes against the Fire Nation for which he will be executed. And so they, they take the, the, do they take the hood off at this point? Um, yeah. Uh, have you anything to say in your defense, you despicable beast? And so, from a distance, she notices that like Yun's features were smudged heavily with dirt. He wore the same robes uh, he'd appeared at in the party. And the confession here, you you'll notice as I read it, it's, it's very blunt, it's very to the point. It is exactly what you would want as the Fire Lord in terms of, oh, this guy has just confessed to everything. No, I infiltrated the palace, I assaulted the members of the court, I vandalized the royal gallery, I killed Chancellor Dairin, and I did it all at the behest of the Sawan clan. I was paid by Huazo of the Sawan to humiliate Fire Lord Zoryu. I blasphemed by t faking signs from the spirits of the islands, I committed foul deeds here and in North Chungling to instigate war uh, that might put the usurper Chaijin on the throne. So immediately the crowd erupts into treason, and as we know, it's the Sewan clan that has sort of been the one in the ascendancy this whole time. So at this assembly, like a quarter of the crowd there is Sewan clan, and suddenly the rest of the clans immediately turn on them. They fully believe what has just been said here, because it looks just like Yun, this guy. Um, 
So this is just this crazy thing where, um, you know, it says here, faster than lightning. It was gang math. The Sao one had really overstepped their bounds recently, hadn't they? They were the largest family, but their numbers paled in comparison to the rest of the Fire Nation, unified. And this is, I suppose, the one weakness of Huazo's strategy was that as much as they're a prosperous clan right now, they are only still one clan. And while it's great that they're in the ascendancy and they're plotting and doing everything right, this was always going to be the case if they were ever caught out, that this would sort of mean the end of the clan, more or less. The whole clan would be viewed as being traitors and they wouldn't be able to stand up to the combined might of sort of everyone against them. Um, because if they were proven to be traitors, it wouldn't just be the Kyoso clan going against them, it would be everyone, and that's what happens here. The Fire Nation folk were decisive people. The rest of the clans found no more upside to being allied with the Sawan. They turned on their neighbours with even greater violence than the Kyoso, pummeling anyone wearing stone camellias into submission with demonstrative zeal. Uh, needing to make up for lost ground, palace guards, presumably loyal to Zoryu, were floating into the room. No one wanted to be caught sympathising with the traitors. So, as this is happening, this big, basically, riot is happening at the assembly, Zoryu, some guards, and the prisoner, Yoon, basically, are escorted off. And so Kyoshi wants to figure this out. She follows them because, of course, she wants to talk to Yoon. So as she runs out after them uh, through the stage exit, um, some of the guards do attack her. And so she has to, like, airbend them out of the way to go after this uh, Yoon here. He's, he has, like, iron shackles on and so on. Um, and yeah, they just get across that no one in this case is a match for Kyoshi. This is Kyoshi against random guards. She's easily able to um, dismiss them as easy as possible. Um, using airbending is quite interesting. The dirty secret of airbending Kyoshi had learned through experience was that it was absolutely devastating in close quarters. Surrounded by hard objects, the gentle art of monks and nuns turned utterly brutal. She sent wind back and forth with rapid changes of direction. The guards were taken by their midsections, flung into spine-rattling collisions with walls and ceilings. They collapsed into armoured heaps. So she's left alone at this point with Yoon. And as she gets a better look at him, she's like, who are you? Who are you really? I know you're not Yoon. And he's like, uh, no, I am Yoon. I'm the false avatar. I'm all this. Like, he, he clearly has some sort of a script going on here. Um, so she snatched away the cloth tied over his eyes to reveal golden irises. He was Fire Nation. Though he looked very much like the man he was impersonating. He had the same handsome, handsome planes to his face as you, and the same hair, the same build. The similarity was amazing, as brotherly as Zoryu and Cheijin. Um, so, just some very, very interesting stuff going on here. So, the second she properly hears him speak up close, she also realizes, okay, he's a fake as well. And um, so, he's, he's not going to be good enough to trick anyone who knows Yoon well. But it's absolutely good enough to trick the entire Fire Nation, who have only seen him once performing the act against them of course um, so very clever ploy in all of this but what's even worse here and it's this brutal move from Zoryu here is that as Kyoshi basically tries to free this guy who's going to be executed to resolve this problem he's like what are you doing and she's like stop moving I'm trying to get you out of here I won't let you die for crimes you didn't commit you can't leave me alone I need this and Kyoshi's like wait 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 what you need to die? And he's like, um, yes, my family in Hanawu, we have nothing, less than nothing, my debts. The, the Fire Lord promised me they'd be paid off upon my death. This is the last thing I can do for my wife and children. Please, I was promised a quick and merciful execution. My family will starve if I don't do this. Save me and you'll be killing them. And he, he also, he is so in the belief that this is the right thing to do, that he is presenting the excuses that like Zoryu or one of the higher-ups would give to this yet he is the one going to die for this and this just hurts Kyoshi to her core to hear someone say this like the guy who's about to be killed says the court needs its scapegoat doesn't it I understand the situation I'm not stupid letting me die is necessary for the country he spoke the Fire Lord's argument on Zoryu's behalf everything was necessary so um that yeah, and then the whole world, down to the victim himself, was whispering in her ear to stand back and let it happen. 
And we end the chapter with just Kiyoshi just staring up at the sky and just screaming in frustration at the situation that she's in. That she should be able to help this guy, but she can't because this is the victory move. Zoryu, in his one move in the entire book, has won the day by just acting like with this double of Yoon, he has captured them and he's got a confession in front of everyone and he's got everyone immediately turned against the um, yeah, the Sawan and now the Sawan have basically been captured. It's over at this point. Like Yoon is still out there but as we know he's not actually particularly interested in the Fire Nation politics. He used that as a distraction but his goals are Heyron, not the Fire Nation itself. Um, so it's such an interesting thing of like, basically her side that she's allied with here has won, but the way in which they won is not something she agrees with at all. Just someone innocent having to die to just get money for his family. It's uh, terrible, absolutely terrible for her. Uh, Kyoshi screamed in the darkness over and over again, her hatred for the world and herself spiraling into oblivion. Um, very, very interesting chapter. Again, it's, it's another one of these kind of quick chapters, but I like what it ha handles immediately of just Kyoshi's like just emotionally broken after the failure of her plan. Then Zoryu acts and wins with this sudden reveal of, oh, like a double for Yoon. What a, what a clever way to counter the one thing that they don't seem to be able to do, which is to capture Yoon because he's so powerful. But if Yoon doesn't come back, you know, um, this is this looks amazing. And either way, currently the Fire Lord has the Sawan clan captive. And even when, you know, Jin and Wazo come back now, they're traitors. That Kyoshi keeping them out of the way with enough time for Zoryu to give this speech means there's no defense here. They're, the clan leaders were not there. And they don't know what Kyoshi did as such. So even if these rumors come out, they'll completely be overshadowed by the fact that a confession has been directly been made by Yoon, that the the leaders of the Sewon clan made all of this stuff happen. And the Fire Nation, as we see here, they're very quick to just do the easiest thing that they can to make themselves look good, and that there was sort of a sense of, like, we'll ally ourselves with the Sewon if they're going to do well. The second they, are tur they turn out to be in the wrong, everyone turns against them. And this is the terrible side of the Fire Nation here with the clan disputes um, and just how quickly fortunes can turn like this. So very, very interesting stuff here in this chapter. But uh, that's been my thoughts on this one. In the comments, let me know what your thoughts were. But that's been the video. Thanks for watching and bye.